We, we thought that we have a short round here and then we open for Q&A, but only one minute. Who wants to make a comment on? Yes, uh, Walter. Um, okay, please, James, Paul. James Carver once said if he had to be reborn, he'd want to be a bond dealer because they have more power than the politicians. You heard this from the finance minister of Canada. Uh, with a global financial system, what people in country A think about country B has a terrible impact on B. One of the points of, uh, which I think Joe is hinting at, and certainly was in parts of Keynes plan, is that besides settling this surplus uh, problem, is that countries should be allowed to have capital controls, which by the way, the United States did in its golden age in the 1950s and 60s. So you also have to think of limiting the ability of foreigners to buy American products. Obviously, when they bought all this crap that we call TARP, it created a worldwide fashion, and we should not uh, permit free ex uh, capital flows. Uh, as well. I think you all would agree with that. Thank you very much. Jeff Lasbeck? Yeah, Hannah. very briefly, I just want to, to re-emphasize what I did not, I didn't put uh, uh, the whole balance there for Germany. For Germany, the whole experiment was a failure. Let's be sure that it was a failure. If you look at Europe now, the export markets in Europe are uh, in extremely bad shape. Germany has fought its clients all the time by this kind of uh, uh, competition of nations. They fought their clients, what they did not understand because they thought it's like competition of companies where you're not automatically fighting your clients, but uh, competition of nations is, means, implies in the end you're, you're uh, going against your own clients. And this is where we are now. The clients are in very bad shape. The domestic market is flat, there's nothing, uh, and it will be extremely difficult to revise the whole German economic policy model. It has to be turned from uh, the head to the feet, and uh, this will be a major exercise, and I do not uh, see the political forces that uh, could do it in the next years. And this implies, this implies, it really implies that we do not find a solution in Europe, and that uh, Europe has, uh, will fail. Yeah, it was too, too difficult. Just give up. <laughs> yeah. You give up. I, I just give up and leave it to you. You have <laughs> your own judgment. Oh, and, uh, do your analysis and do it properly. Yeah. As, to, uh, as to fighting the clients, I just want to make a remark myself. Uh, German export to Greece is accounting for 0.5%. Of, I'm not talking of about German, Greece at all. Of German I mean, exports, I, just for the, uh, uh, the, the relations, obviously. So, there's a nothing... Uh, 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 Joe, you want to make... No, I, I talked okay. long enough. If there's not here, we now have... Oh, 10, 12 minutes left for Q&A. I will, I will collect a number, and if you want to tell us whom do you direct your question to, or if not, I will ask those who are... Who feel free to... Answer yes, please. We'll start here. I'm John Chisholm from Silicon Valley. Uh, Professor Steglitz, I might have misheard you, and don't let me put words in your mouth, uh, but uh, the average U.S. household is worse off today than we were 15 years ago. Is that approximately correct? I, I hear that, and I also recognize we are enjoying so many innovations that we didn't have 15 years ago, free, uh, entertainment online, uh, mapping, uh, medical advice, uh, education, free long distance phone calls, all of these made possible through the internet. Uh, I could go on and on. And I wonder if, surely these innovations have improved the quality of life even though they're not reflected in GDP. And might we be entering a new technology era in which improvements in the quality of life are no longer linked to increases in GDP or uh, economic growth? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next. Can, can um, we speed the, things up? We, do I, we have a second mic eventually in the room so we can give it to the next question? 
this is a question for, for Heiner Flasbeck, which is where are, the, where are the unions? If your analysis is true, isn't part of the answer using collective wage bargaining in Germany, which used to be one of its great strengths, to deliver higher real wages, and in that context, coordinated wage bargaining across the Euro area to deliver relative gains in competitiveness for Southern Europe without nominal declines in wages. Okay, next. Yeah. yeah. Do we have a second mic in the room? Uh, two quick questions. For the back. Go to the back and go to the middle of the room and I will direct you there. Okay. Yeah. One to Norbert. Uh, you were speaking about the importance of demographics and I have a poster in my room from the CDU election campaign from North Rhine-Westphalia. Kinderstadt in the, I think you remember oh that. Oh gosh. Yes, I do. And uh, it's interesting to you know, know what the perspective, and this, this meant kids, not Indians, uh, which, and, and not Turks either, of course. Um, and the second quick question, which I, I expect Peter will extract an answer for, because this discussion seems to be quite abstract. We're talking as though policymakers have all these levers in front of them. They can tweak them. We're talking as though the German position, the Chinese position, a number of other positions are primarily the result of conscious government policy, that if only governments decided, if the finance minister decided, we could change all the macroeconomic balances. But it's actually not true. And so how do you reconcile the macro adjustments that need to be made with the, with the fact that they are the end result, only partly of government policy, but to a large extent of bottom-up phenomenon? If no one answered that question, I will, I will address that. <laughs> so, uh, in, yeah, we, we, where's the mic? In, in the middle of the room, please, the gentleman in the white shirt. Thank you very much. And can the next one raise his, his finger, Riley? So go with the next one. Yeah, the gentleman in the white shirt in the middle. And um, Yeah. A uh, question for uh, Joe Stiglitz. You mentioned a Granger causality test for one country, one of the OECD countries, where the causality goes from uh, the trade deficit to the fiscal deficit. Um, for the other countries, is it uh, a different result, or have they just not been studied that way? So that was the fourth question. I would take a fifth. Yes, at the back there, yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is actually, uh, one of them is uh, already asked. Do you think that an increase in uh, wages in Germany is going to be enough for the adjustment? And if you think it is, how much should they increase? And the second question is, uh, we know that the clearing union that was proposed by Keynes was never implemented, but if you think that an alternative institution uh, under the current IMF arrangement uh, were to be uh, de devised, what would it look like? Thank you. Okay, I, I would ask um, very brief comments on this, on the questions, because otherwise we're not going through. Please, I, I just start here. If you don't have one, um, plus back. I don't. For me first? I, I, I know, you want to start. We just go this way. Yeah, okay. Just a okay, first of all, Silicon Valley households are probably doing quite well. You ought to go to Tennessee Valley. I used to live in Oxford. There's a big difference. Okay. He, he's just saying the average is now, not, not yeah. that the Silicon Valley people are doing poorly. And it's very hard to think of Facebook as a, as a great improvement in your quality of life when you still have outdoor plumbing in Tennessee Valley. So uh, you've got to be very careful about okay. that. Secondly, uh, the U.S. deficit, uh, the country, the deficit of last resort, since 1980, the U.S. has also been the engine of economic growth for the whole rest of the world. Yeah. If for any reason we had stopped spending that money, the rest of the world would have been in much worse shape. So I think we have to thank the United States for being okay. this deficit country, not, not saying yeah. let's get rid of the deficit. Okay. Yeah. I, I, can, I can answer the three questions where we're all on wages uh, in one yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, Two, the, the question the wage adjustment will not be the sufficient condition for a European adjustment. Second, it will take a very long time. It will take 10, 15 years, uh, depending on uh, what, what you uh, are willing to do, where you want to go. So if, for example, Germany would have nominal wages of 5% with given productivity of one and a half, say, then it would, uh, given an adjustment, a slow adjustment of nominal wages in the other countries, it would take some 10, 15 years. 
uh, to remove the, the gap, huh? to remove the gap and removing the competitiveness gap is absolutely indispensable because other countries, all the other countries cannot go on and lose market shares year by year. Germany was the only country, despite China and all the rest, that has uh, kept its market shares or even gained market shares globally. All the other countries have dramatic losses in market shares. It's absolutely unsustainable. So uh, there has to be an adjustment. We can only choose what kind of adjustment. Yeah. So what I propose is a nominal adjustment of wages so that unit labor costs rise by, say, 2.5%, 3% in Germany over over 10 to 15 years, the other countries adjust, that will not be sufficient to bring yeah. the European uh, economy out of recession. There we need additional measures. We will need uh, f uh, expansionary fiscal policy, but that, again, that has to come from Germany. But if we're not starting to discuss it here, if we're not even discussing it here over there somewhere, uh, then uh, there is no way out that we can, we can settle the crisis. And you see the crisis is coming back uh, by the day. So, and Sonny Kapoor's question, well, it was policy. It was not the unions giving in, just it was first an agreement between unions and policy, and then it was massive pressure okay. from politics on the unions uh, not to follow the old uh, mm -hmm. model of Germany with real wages at least rising uh, in line with productivity. Uh, Joe? Yeah. Um, first, on the, on the question about uh, what hap what's happened to standards of living, uh, the uh, metric I was talking about is median household income, which adjusts for inflation. Those adjustments do try to take into quality of the products. Uh, uh, of the products. So if, if products get better, they're called hedonic price indices. So they do take into account. But uh, there are many things that are not incorporated. But obviously, uh, having uh, better internet is not going to help the person who doesn't have access to a computer. And overall, I think the general assessment is that things have gotten worse. If you measured insecurity, uh, access to insurance, the quality of insurance, the uncertainty, probably appropriately measured standards of living have fallen even more than these data uh, would indicate. Uh, on the uh, question of, uh, that was raised is, uh, uh, what are the instruments that government has? As I said, it's a mixture of markets and government. It's a, a mixture. But there are lots of instruments that are available that affect them. Some of them are macro. Uh, some of them are micro policies, policies about unionization that, that affect wage, uh, wage levels. Um, there are policies of interest rates. The government QE2 was an attempt to add competitive devaluation. Uh, so that there are actually lots of range of policies uh, and you think of these as a concerted whole, and they have certain consequences. Nobody sets out to mm. say, I'm going to have a surplus. The final yeah. one on the question about uh, uh, Granger causality, we looked at all G7 countries, and um, most of them, neither uh, the, the fiscal deficit didn't cause the trade deficit or vice versa. Uh, it was, in one case, it was very clear, though, that the trade deficit was Granger causing the fiscal deficit. Thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah. As to um, policy, policymakers having the levers to change certain issues, particularly in demographics, it's very obvious uh, that to uh, change fertility, uh, you have to have a long-term approach, and you certainly don't have easy answers. And therefore, I guess, uh, to studying the different cases that are quite different in the old world, in the democratic old world, with a fertility of 2.2 in the US, with something close to two in England, Scandinavia, and France, and 1.3 in Spain, Italy, Russia, Germany, uh, leave something to be open for analysis. And I, I, I believe there could be some convergence, but it's something that's not in the hand of the politicians. It is much more complex and societal. Uh, as to uh, one word, as to European collective, uh, European um, wage level, uh, on a collective basis, uh, in a world that increases the share of services, as is the case, it's very obvious that the unionization of our labor markets is going to be smaller, not just in the US, but elsewhere as well. And therefore, um, collective uh, wage settlements at the EU level probably are very difficult to get by. And therefore, if politicians want to have a lever at this 
very question. Minimum wages might be the only solution to that issue. I just wanted to be honest, uh, not, to, uh, not to have expectations that are too high. Thank you. So we have a quick round. I'm, I saw, um, yes, Niels Tigerson, and uh, please, the mic. We need the mic, quickly. Niels? And anyone else would just, yeah, please, can you already go there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, like Norbert Walter, I was in Baden in 1978. And not only uh, those of us uh, coming from Europe were castigated by the Americans who were there, but the, more significantly, uh, German officials were castigated, uh, the people in Helmut Schmidt's government in particular. And that legacy left a sour taste in, in Germany. It happened again in the 1980s. The claims from the United States appreciate your currency or stimulate domestic demand. Germany didn't really want to do either, but it integrated with the rest of Europe and it thought it had gotten rid of the problem. But now it's coming back, of course, after the long period when German surpluses have disappeared for the reasons Norbert uh, explained. But there are really two other ways of uh, uh, adjusting the German surplus. Uh, uh, one is to um, uh, do some more to liberalize the domestic sector in Germany, uh, uh, which is lagging behind and, and which could lead to larger imports, particularly of services in, in Germany. That would be a direct help. Uh, the other thing is, of course, to take a greater interest in how capital exports from Germany are used. Uh, we shouldn't all think of, of just capital exports buying uh, government bonds abroad, but making German direct investments abroad. Yes. So these uh, methods of adjustment, I think, are more significant. I'd like your comments, Norbert. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Uh, Michael Kummer from the International Monetary Fund. I just have one remark on Dr. Walter's uh, demographic story. Um, I think maybe your demographics uh, doesn't go deep enough because basically uh, the way you treat um, the German situation is that you're saying the Germans are basically saving for a rainy day for the, or for the time when, when a lot of people retire. The Germans are doing this and they're doing that by accumulating um, um, uh, uh, bonds uh, uh, that foreigners uh, owe. The, the problem is that uh, the policies that led to this situation uh, led to something where you can no longer talk about the Germans because it, it, was, uh, it involved a lot of increase in inequality so that the people who are doing this saving for, uh, for their retirement are, is really just the top slice of the German population, yep. whereas the others uh, are, are not really saving. Uh, I don't know okay. what the proportions of the two are, but then uh, th this, uh, because that, you made that uh, story out as being a reason why this is all benign, Maybe it's benign for Can the top slice of the population. It's okay. not benign for the rest. Okay, we got the point. Uh, yes, please, in the middle, mm -hmm. lady. Thank you. My name is Maya Gupla. I work for the World Future Council. And I would like to push back on what Sony Kapoor, I think, was getting at, the way forward. I think we're still stuck in the analysis of the problem. And we see there that it's so intricately linked everything that my feeling is all politicians are fearful of pushing one lever that makes the thing go down. So if I was going to hear from the panel maybe a policy package of five, six, seven policies that they think need to be taken on in parallel in order to avoid the frictions that could make it come down, and which level of governance would be yep. sufficient and important for doing that in the next, let's say, five years. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, I think, yes, please. Um, Mariana Mazzucato, Professor of Economics at the University of Sussex. What if um, we just said for a minute that the reason that Germany is a surplus country is not because it has lower relative wages, but actually because it has one of the highest R&D to GDP ratios. It has a system, a very dynamic system of patient capital mm -hmm. through the KFW and the Landesbank that was mentioned this morning. It has all sorts of training institutes which have invested heavily in human capital. The recipe for the you know, so-called pig countries that Goldman Sachs has called them would be very different. They need to be spending more in R&D. They need to be spending more in human capital and developing patient capital. Um, the problem is, one says, there's no money. Where are they going to get the money from? So the European Investment Bank, I haven't heard this word mentioned once today. Brazil has BNDS, which is spending on exactly these kind of things, but you need solidarity. So just one quick sort of very concrete way this could be done is you have surplus in Germany, deficit in Greece, you have sun in Greece, you have wind in Ireland, invest the German surplus through different vehicles that the EIB could um, structure in 
uh, 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 Greek solar energy, not just tur uh, tourism, in Irish wind, or anyway, in different areas of productive investment. So the EIB must become one of the leading forces in the Troika. Thank you very much. Um, I do not see any other, and I couldn't take it, so uh, thank you for <laughs> cooperating with me. Uh, we do a very quick round, and including the question, uh, what is, uh, as the title of the panel is, is mercantilism doomed to fail? That was the, was the question mark, the title, and maybe you can answer this with yes or no, and uh, including the answers to the various um, questionnaires. May I start? Yeah, please. Yeah, well, the last uh, question, unfortunately, it's wrong. Principally, it's wrong because countries have to adjust to their productivity. So if you have higher productivity, it's a nice thing. But as Martin Wolf put the day before yesterday in, in the Financial Times, uh, it's a confusion between productivity and competitiveness. If you adjust your wages to your productivity, uh, then it's fine, then you have nobody, no one in the world has a problem. But uh, that has to be done by all countries. And, uh, uh, because wages are negotiated at the national level. It's not like companies. You cannot compare here countries with companies. Companies uh, are wage takers, so to say, and they uh, compete with their productivity. Countries are not wage takers. Countries are wage setters, and they're competing with labor costs, unit okay. labor costs, and Thank not you. with productivity. The okay. second, let me quickly say the yeah, second yeah. thing uh, about the five points. As long, I can make it very simple. I, I mentioned already some elements of the package. But as long as you have total denial in Germany about the external imbalances problem inside the monetary union, and this is what we have at this moment of time, there will be no solution whatsoever. Okay. I yes. see something about the demography. I understand that the Germans are very unhappy that they have to support the Greeks who don't work and they just dance around in the streets. If the demographers, uh, the Germans are saving for their old age. Just think when they get old and they spend all this money in Greece to get food and clothing because they're not making it. What will the Greeks think? They're working so hard just to support the Germans. If you don't want to support the Greeks, why should they want to support the Germans? Joe, do you want to? Okay, just very, very briefly, I, I, to, to recast what I uh, said, can mercantilism, um, is, is mercantilism doomed to fail? Mercantilism doomed to fail. Uh, I guess my view is, it is inevitable that there will be some countries that have surpluses, some countries that have deficits. That's part of uh, 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 differences across country. But I think many of the large surpluses are not consistent, uh, are not, are not, uh, uh, won't be able to survive. And something in the global system will have to give. Now, in my talk, I listed four things, a global reserve system, a global regulatory system, reform of the global trade system, and better coordination of global uh, monetary policies. I do agree that there are some other uh, uh, things that, particularly here in Europe, that one could do. Uh, one of them is euro bonds, uh, a, a framework for uh, sh sharing the, the uh, uh, fiscal uh, space. And the other one, I think the idea of the European Investment Bank is, is, as a mechanism of recycling uh, surplus is very important and, and a very good one, one mm -hmm. I've, I advocated before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now we're about. Can I just? I, I was reminded that I indicated that I would say a word about migration and didn't. Uh, migration, I, be I believe, in demographics is the one variable that could be influenced at a shorter interval. And it's quite obvious uh, that Germany was lagging behind. We were not good enough in this for a long time. And I sincerely hope that we are constructive uh, as, as a business sector and as, and as a country uh, to uh, help uh, to avoid the high youth unemployment in, in Southern Europe uh, by offering the opportunities that are obvious in our country. Uh, and I guess, again, this could be a, a productive and cooperative solution. As to many of the other remarks that have been made in the last round, I'm quite happy because it indicates a consensus that I would consider very important indeed. It is very important to have smarter ways uh, to invest surpluses of countries that are in current account surplus for now, uh, particularly if they are interested in, uh, and do understand that these uh, uh, surpluses are, are temporary. And I would cer certainly go very much along uh, to argue that quite a few countries in, in the, the pigs countries, by, uh, by considering uh, R&D 
and uh, labor market improvement would uh, prepare the ground for more foreign direct investment in their place. And I'm pretty sure that Europe has a number of institutional arrangements in place that could support from the government side, from the international banking side, uh, investment going in the right direction into an, in a, into an optimal solution. And as to um, the, the question whether only the top slice of, of German income uh, is benefiting <coughs> from the internationalization of, of, asset, of asset allocation, the answer is no. Thank God the Social Democratic government understood and the, uh, the, 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 deputy, the deputy chairman of the IG Metall, uh, Herr Riester, when he was Labour Minister, understood that our pay-as-you-go system, our old, age, our old age pension system is not good enough for a long run, and therefore the Riester Rente was established. And this Riester Rente, of course, has to invest its money, and this has to be invested in a, in a more meaningful way through the pension funds, through the life insurance companies, and Niels, you are right, uh, it, it can be done in a much better way than it has been done so far. Can I just leave the, yep, please, the audience with a question? Who's the world's largest debtor? And why is it the rest of the world is willing to lend them money at almost 0% interest rate? If they're so large a debtor, why aren't they worried about them defaulting? I agree. Thank you very much. I apologize for maybe all the questions who have not been answered. This is my fault. And uh, the brilliant answers, of course, is only up to our four speakers. I'd like to thank all of them. And I have, uh, I have back. I just have one remark. I just want to yeah. make one remark in closing this. Um, I'm glad for those who came up and mentioned that we have to do think, to thinking about entrepreneurial activities, about innovation, patent registered. Uh, you have this in countries uh, like in the US, 800 people, one patent for 800 people. In Greece, one patent for 27,000 people in the population. You can go on like this, doing business in the world. Greece is 109 behind Bangladesh on the framework conditions. So what we need, I think, just more research also in the micro conditions of the current account surpluses and deficit and of what has been debated here. And I'm so glad, Herr Flasbeck, that this came out, that we need much more research in the analysis in that. Thank you very much for that. Well, coming up.